Ann Davis Key. She received her PhD from Ben. Psychology, quantitative psychology. She's been at the University of Michigan since 1996 and has uh, many appointments in the Michigan spirit. So she's a faculty member in the Department of Psychology. She's appointed in the Survey Research Center and Research Center for Group Dynamics. Has an appointment at the Center for Human Growth and Development. And there's probably a couple more that are forgetting about as well. <laughs> so she's a very inter interdisciplinary and well connected on this campus. Um, from what I understand about today's talk, it's going to be a little bit different than the talks we've had uh, this semester, and that Pam's going to go over some ideas of a grant proposal that she's currently working on, a program grant. And she'd like this to be somewhat interactive so that we can discuss some of the ideas and potentially influence the writing of this massive proposal. <laughs> and then I think at the end, there's going to be a, somewhat of a team coming up to the front to, uh, <laughs> to be able to answer some more questions and Great. brainstorm. All right, All right yeah. thanks. Um, so today I'm going to show you a little bit about why it is that I'm um, a behavioral scientist and now I'm looking at genetics and neuroscience, so kind of um, why I'm now incorporating that into the work that I do. And then I'm going to talk about a large program project grant that's been in the works for, oh, many years. <laughs> looking at Fred Morrison because he's my uh, partner in crime on this. Um, it was uh, first based in New York and now it's all at University of Michigan. And I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to show you some things that have people from New York's name in it, but I'll tell you how they're not in it <laughs> and who at University of Michigan is. And then I'm going to ask, I have other uh, co-PIs here, Fred Morrison, Luke Hyde, Coulter Mitchell, and unfortunately Chris Monk cannot be here. Uh, and we're going to talk um, a little bit about what we're thinking. I'm going to show you some of the models that, that will look familiar from the research that I do. And then kind of open it up to kind of the things that, that we um, need to worry about. Feel free to um, think of yourself as a reviewer of this and the kind of issues that you might have uh, as we talk through this, because we like to hear it. It's good for us to hear this uh, ahead of time, but it's a pretty large undertaking here at University of Michigan. So um, this is under this umbrella of a group that's uh, at ISR, Population Neurodevelopment and Genetics Collaborative. And this started off um, with Fred and I having conversations about the fact that we wanted to add to our own research areas uh, neuroscience, but also uh, genetics as, as we were looking at what is predicting to behavior. Um, we now know that genetics has a little bit of a, a well, more of a, a loose connection, but neuroscience may have a stronger connection. And so we wanted to add that to what um, Fred looks at, which is reading and self-regulation, and, and the, some of the work I look at, which is socioeconomic status to issues of math achievement. Um, we brought a bunch of people together to see if it was even possible for us to talk to each other, whether anybody would even want, want to consider this, and it ended up being lots of people wanted to talk about it. On top of that, um, my background looking at socioeconomic status uh, brings in the whole aspects of the fact that we almost never have representative samples in psychology. And neuroscience has been going along with uh, very, very small sample sizes, 30, 40. Um, and, but we were saying really large things about what the brain is doing without any representation across the population. So we also asked um, whether or not sociologists, public health people might be interested in being involved. And one of the, um, I'm not going to be talking about this particular study, but one of the first innovations of this was to add um, on the national study, the fragile families, which is a birth cohort, starts at zero. The kids are now 15 years of age. Uh, it collects all of the information um, on socioeconomic status, marital status, many of the sociology variables that are important. But it also has the addition of having genetics collected at age nine. nine. Uh, and is now being collected again at age 15, but also at age 15, we're, um, we're imaging the brains of the kids that are um, in the Detroit and Toledo uh, representative sample of that large national sample of fragile families. So that's our first attempt to have on a representative data set um, all of the things that we're, we're interested in. What I'm going to talk to you about today is new data collection that we're going to do where we're also going to try to do this by incorporating all three of those areas. But 
This is an ongoing group. Um, it's pretty large, but we're happy to have as many people that are interested in the topic. So if you're interested, just let us know. We, um, we meet monthly uh, to, to discuss ongoing grants that we have funded and are currently collecting data and, and new grants that are getting submitted. So this is a model that I've been working on for a while with the addition uh, in this little section here of neurocognitive skills. So I look at family influences on children. Um, socioeconomic status or particularly parent educational attainment is, is the variable that I look at primarily. Um, this is from looking over multiple, multiple studies where we looked at family influences in psychology, but we didn't look at the fact that socioeconomic status has a real impact on what families are doing in the home environment. Um, often the people looking at poverty samples, so income, were showing large effects of income. But if you look at more normative samples and even the poverty samples, you see that parents' education attainment has an even stronger influence on achievement. It also has it on health outcomes and problem behavior. So something about parents' educational attainment matters. Um, and so, a little music to get us all in the mood. Um, so these are the kind of things I look at, parent values, uh, and I look at achievement uh, outcomes, but with, uh, when Prithi Shah took a, a sabbatical, two sabbaticals ago, she and I collaborated uh, and decided that one of the mediators that I don't have in here is what goes between the parents and the academic achievement, and these are the children's neurocognitive skills. And so I started looking at whether or not SES was related to what we call, um, in many different ways, but we'll, we'll say executive function. Some call it regulation. Some call it cognitive skills. Um, which are things like inhibition, delay of gratification, um, a working memory. Uh, what are these type of uh, pre-academic skills that may relate to achievement skills? So this was the first study where we uh, tried to look at this. This is, um, we wanted to look at these SES differences. We wanted to look at, at whether or not we could see them on executive function. And I'm, uh, if anybody wants, I'm just gonna go through these quickly. Um, we have found SES differences. Kim Noble had found that home literacy skills were influenced um, uh, by uh, SES differences, and they were looking at parent uh, educational attainment. I can tell you, in, in general, when psychologists have used SES, they call it SES, but it's almost always been parent education attainment. They really actually have uh, income in, which is why you, you see in my models I have both, because I want to look at the pathways from income but also the pathways from uh, educational attainment as well. Parent warmth was also associated with memory, but it was a little bit looser. Um, and cognitive stimulation in the home has been kind of the primary one that people found looking at inhibition and working memory and delay of gratification. So just on this one study, we're looking at is home behaviors a mediator, because I know it's a mediator from previous work I've done to academic achievement, but is it mediating or what parents doing actually impacting and developing these cognitive skills? So we use the NICHD child care study, which has uh, about 1,400 kids in it. It is not a national sample. So it is uh, done through sites around the United States, but it does not represent um, the US in kind of any imaginable way. Um, it really is a convenient sample, but a convenient sample at multiple sites. Um, you'll see that it's uh, mostly European American, 14% uh, African American, and about half, half male and female. Uh, so we looked at income to needs, mother's education, uh, the PBBT, a vocabulary test for moms. We were trying to control a little bit for IQ of the, of the parent. Uh, we looked at stimulation, warmth, chaos, or physical environment, and maternal acceptance, which is another kind of former, but it's, it's they're acceptable as they are, what kind of their behavior. So it's not do you hug or do you speak nicely to your kid. It's whether or not you're generally okay with their behavior. So it's a little bit of a different scale than the warmth scale. We looked at working memory. Uh, now in this case, working uh, with Prithi Shah, who's a cognitive psychologist, we looked at what NICHD called their executive functions uh, and how they were measuring it. Um, she wasn't very, very happy with exactly what we use, but this is what was used at the time in the, in the data set. So Woodcock Johnson, memory for sentences, sustained attention with the continuous performance task, which is a cognitive psych task. Uh, response inhibition is day-night stroop. In this case, it's very simple, and in fact, these kids seal out very quickly on this. If you see a picture of a, um, the sun, you have to say night. 
If you see a picture of the moon, you have to say day. And so when these flash in front of the kids, they have to say the opposite. So they have to um, inhibit uh, a proponent response. Propon is that a proponent response to it? Delay of gratification, I'll show you this. Many of you know this. This has become so famous. Um, um, Jim Heckman talks about it all the time in Perry Preschool. It's become the big thing that predicts forever. And it's the marshmallow test. All right, so this is a test, and this is exactly what it was done in the NICHD using the marshmallows. It's wait seven minutes, so you walk in with the, the child, you put a marshmallow down in front of a kid, um, and you say, if you wait until I come back into the room, you'll get two marshmallows. And I always tell people, they could say that to me, I hate marshmallows, I could go all day <laughs> and not eat those marshmallows. So there's a little bit of an individual difference in there, but let's assume they really want that marshmallow. Uh, and so then they, they count the time. Do the kids wait? There are great videos, if anybody wants to look on YouTube, at these videos of what kids do when they're trying to wait so they can get their two marshmallows, how they kind of play with the marshmallow, and, and uh, how they actually, which I don't know if anyone's ever studied, but kind of the waiting behavior. They do a lot of rocking. They do you know, back and forth. They do stuff to try to keep themselves entertained so they won't eat the marshmallow. Uh, so we looked at that. So we believe that home environment will actually socialize or predict to the executive functions just like they will to achievement. Uh, this is the model. That I, I, I only throw this up. So, th so this is the tested model, the analysis model. Um, I'm not going to show those lines anymore. But this is really to show, uh, and I like to show this for uh, the economist in the room, that everything is controlled on everything else. So it, it's really a very large regression controlled model but we're able to look at the unique pathways between uh, the parenting um, and the cognitive outcome. We've since redone this now where we actually have, uh, we initially did this on all single outcomes, but now we, we actually have it as a multivariate outcome. So now we have all the executive functions controlling for all the other executive functions going on. So th this is just to show some of the, um, the differences that we know. I keep switching back and forth for those of you. Uh, where my pointer is that uh, we see s some race differences. These are direct and indirect effects. Uh, some income to needs, a whopping mother's education effect, which we almost always find. Marital status, which holds in almost all of our models um, as well, that there's an effect of uh, whether you're married or not. Uh, and then we look at kind of the direct effects on working memory. You can see cognitive stimulation is the big uh, winner for this, but we also have one that holds up and it's very intriguing to us because um, we're thinking a lot about this, is physical environment and even in our more stringent models and we've tried a few different things, physical environment ends up being this um, very strong predictor of executive function and, and these questions are very interesting. So it's, um, is the house monotonous? So which means, are there pictures on the wall, is it colorful or does it all look one way? Um, do you feel safe? in your home? Is there someone you could go to if there was an emergency? So it's interesting to us that physical environment is predicting um, to these executive functions. And if anyone has any ideas, we're constantly pinging around why physical environment uh, would have an effect over other things in psychology that we know of. So feel free to let me know what you think. So uh, endlessly, and my students know this, um, I. I ask this question, why? Um, so why is this happening? What are the other mechanisms? What could be going on? And as soon as there was this connection with the executive functions, I wondered then what the connection was for the brain. And that's what really led me into looking at neuroscience, which is I'm, I'm looking at the home. I'm looking at parents developing kids. What are they doing that might actually be developing the brain? if we're seeing some of these executive functions being developed as well as achievement. And so that started me down the road and then I talked to Fred Morrison about this already moving down that road um, and we started thinking about, well, we should actually add measures of the brain into our, into our models uh, and see what they look like. Um, and we're also interested in kind of all of these outcomes, um, but keeping it right now to just the executive skills because we actually have measures uh, in the literature that we can use that have been linked uh, to brain-related uh, activity. Uh, genes come in too. <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about that later. So what we um, looked at, this is this peen group. So as we were talking about it and talking about it, um, 
Fred and I had a meeting that was sponsored by um, UMOR, and it was the Social Science, I'm not going to get this right, initiative, uh, where we were supposed to take social science and combine it with other uh, sciences and see if we could come up with new collaborations. And that's when we invited groups of people in that studied genetics and studied the brain and asked the question, uh, is it time for us to do this? The people who came in, uh, Kirby Dieter Deckard and Stephen Cole, I think, uh, were saying, well, I'm not sure you want to do genes right now because we're not finding a lot of correlations. Uh, but neuroscience, we think, would this is a good time to do this, even though I, you know, we weren't re ready to give up genes yet, so we still had genes, but maybe the brain is, is the mediator that we need to look at. So we were going to look at that. Um, so the purpose, um, again, this comes back to the issues of SES. So what we know from Martha Fair and Kim Noble is that children who are growing up in disadvantage are more likely to be neglected, abused, have violence, have family stress, substandard living environments, poor quality neighborhoods and schools. And although each of these aspects of poverty have been examined, few studies have tried to look at these all together and what are the mechanisms of why poverty seems to be getting under the skin. This is actually how NIH is talking about it these days. How is poverty getting under the skin and in the bodies and in the brains of kids? And we know that there are relations um, genetically for, as well for poverty and so that's why we wanted to keep it in there because there's also exposures that are changing, potentially changing um, some of uh, the genetic expressions that we're seeing. So this is the approach of the PO1. So now I'm shifting into how I kind of went from my side, so looking at the home environment, because part of the projects, which I'll talk about primarily is the home project, is what we're doing to look at the home environment. Um, so we're using this naturalistic mandatory cutoff. So this is an advantage of uh, working with Fred Morrison. He's already established the fact that we have this interesting thing in the United States where kids start kindergarten at different ages based on when they're born, right? And, and change it depends on what state uh, you're in. And, and Michigan, I think it's still December 1st. I don't know. I haven't had a kindergarten child in a while. So it was December 1st. I think it still is December 1st. So within weeks of each other, even days of each other, there are kids that go to kindergarten and kids that go another year of preschool or stay at home. Right, all based on their birth date. And so this gives us an opportunity to do, and I'll talk about this later, uh, an analysis, um, an instrumental analysis, so instrumental variable analyses, but it also gives us the ability to look at what happens when you go to school um, at the same age of a group of kids who, who doesn't go to school, and we can look at this differential brain development. In this case, it's in schooling. Um, my part of this is looking at what do they look like before they ever started school. Right? What, what happened prior to that so we can see if there's any changes in the schooling environment that helps us understand this better. But this is a, a great uh, part of the PO1, we think. Um, a number of studies have looked at the effects of home or school, but very few have looked at this transition from home to school on the same parameter. So that's another thing, is that you often get people looking at the home, they look at certain outcomes, then they go in the school, but they don't carry the same measurements across between the home and the school. So we're following across each of these uh, with the same measurements. Um, we want to look at the long-term effects of poverty uh, and early life stress because we think right now that's the information we have, that the reason why kids may be um, developing poorly is because of the, the stress they're getting both from their environment but also as it works through the parent and the poor parenting that they may be getting or the positive parenting they may be getting. Uh, it's working through executive function and emotional regulation, so kids' ability to inhibit their behavior but also inhibit so that they can learn. So we think those things are going on as well and this is affecting academic achievement. And we think that the project acquires this precision of neurobiological data using these advanced imaging and in this case because I always tell people there's more than one kind of imaging, we're using fMRI. So we're looking at um, the functional uh, changes in the brain. Um, we could also look at structural. That's what Kim Noble and Martha Fair have looked at. They've looked at structure to say that there's different structure in kids in poverty. Uh, but we actually want to look at the function difference um, and the connectivity. So for the mechanisms of change, maybe what we're seeing is that kids in these very highly cognitive stimulating environments are actually being able to make 
uh, better uh, synaptic connections than kids who are not in those environments. So that might be, and when they get in school, we might see again some kids getting certain kinds of schooling, certain kinds of curriculum, this kind of surge in synaptic activity, and, and others we may not see as much. Or we might see it all. We just actually don't know the answer to this question, so that's why we're doing the, the grant. This is the model. Um, you'll see it looks a lot like the model I showed you earlier. Uh, we're looking at SES. Uh, measured as completely and, and as well as we can. Uh, we're looking at the home environment, which is project two. We're looking at the school environment, which is project one. Uh, we think stress, parent and child stress, um, is, is going to be related to what's happening in the school. We think this stress is going to influence brain function. Um, this is going to impact um, self-regulation, both cognitive and emotional self-regulation, and, and people usually look at one or the other, emotional or cognitive, we're looking at both. Um, this is going, going to impact IQ and behavior problems and eventually academic achievement. So that's broad. This is our very broad model for the P01. This is kind of what we're doing. I know this is hard to, to look at. We're still working on this, by the way, but this was our, uh, what we thought was going on. When you see Sackler, that's University of Michigan. We're not doing this at Sackler anymore. We're doing it uh, here at University of Michigan. But we want to come in the summer prior to kindergarten um, and get home measures, and then fall and spring get school measures, and then uh, in the next summer actually do the imaging. And I can't remember if we're still doing this. We keep talking about this back and forth. Because part of me being a longitudinal researcher is, is I desperately want to get a pre-brain measure prior to going into schooling so I can make sure whether or not what we're seeing is the case. But we run into a little bit of an issue with the fMRI because it's very difficult to get certain age kids in the fMRI. They won't stay still. You have to stay absolutely still when we do these, these images. Um, so we talked a little bit about whether or not we would potentially do an EEG measure, but I think um, there's this part of us that's thinking maybe we just try to get them in the magnet. Anyway, we're still working on that one. But that, that's because I think if we don't have it prior to them going to school, it's going to be very hard to talk about school-related changes. And then we're going to have three cohorts uh, across time, ending uh, finally with imaging in, the, in year five as our final uh, time, so that we'd at least have two times of imaging so we could look at, at brain changes. Uh, and we're collecting cortisol uh, in the home, which is our, one of the things when we first put this uh, grant in was a lot of cautionary information coming from NIH to be careful about talking about especially candidate genes. Uh, they didn't want to hear about them. They didn't really want to fund them. Um, so we were backing off actually talking about doing genes and hiding it kind of under um, cortisol and saying, okay, well, we're going to collect spit. Um, and, you know, okay, if at some point in time we want to do something else with spit other than look at cortisol, you know, we'll put another grant in for that. But we're not doing genes. Um, so that was one of the things that we did. This uh, is how it looks. And let's see, BJ Casey, who we love and hopefully will continue to be on this, is um, no longer doing Project 3 because this is when it was in New York. And Kim Noble, um, all, both of these we're hoping are going to be consultants but are no longer going to be the PIs of this. I'm going to PI the home and Chris Monk is PIing uh, the neurobiology. And uh, Luke Hyde is on both of these. Fred Morrison is doing the schooling, and Coulter Mitchell is going to work with me on the home, hopefully. Um, what I'm going to talk a lot about today, because this is off my own research, is uh, the home that we're looking at. So this is the same thing again, but more specifically looking at these pink pathways are the home. So we're looking at parent stress, home environment, cortisol, behavior problems, and we don't have the pink here, but literacy and math achievement. But what the pink shows is all the stuff we're collecting in the home environment prior to them starting school. So those uh, are extensive amounts of interviews, spit, uh, questionnaires and observations, um, the cortisol, which we're getting from hair court, uh, as well as from spit. And then um, the literacy and math achievement was actually going to be done I think when they came in to get the, the brain function, or maybe it was at schooling. All right, so here's the specific games. Chart the specific pathways linking variations in the home environment to the SES-related brain changes in the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala uh, to see whether or not we could actually 
find these. So there's, I want to say there's very specific questions to the home project that look a lot like the work I already showed you. These are the ones where we're combining across all the projects. So the P01, one of the innovations of the P01, which isn't necessarily common for P01s, is that we want to collect all these data in all these different groups and combine them into one data set. The real punch is having them all in one data set so we can actually analyze across all of these. Right? A lot of PO1s are just collecting their own data in each of their projects, but we wanted to collect a whole grouping of the projects uh, and, and have all of that information for actually analyzing, and that's the part where I'm going to open up to everybody here, thinking about how one would go about analyzing this kind of data. Uh, there's what I consider to be the old way of analyzing and what I hope will be some innovations from the biosocial methods. Rich, hopefully, <laughs> will give us some of these innovations. Um, so differences in the home environment will mediate through these connections between SES and, and the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. The amygdala is where the emotion is occurring, right? So that's the center part of the brain. This is why we have to use fMRI. We can't get to it from any other imaging except through fMRI because it's so deep in the middle of the brain. And the prefrontal cortex is where uh, working memory and, and other aspects of achievement uh, are going on. So that's why we're looking at both of these. Uh, and in concert, variation both the home environment and the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala function will mediate links between SES. It's basically saying the brain mediates these outcomes. So now I'm going to move to talking a little bit about the proposed analyses. But first, let me tell you a little bit what's going on in Michigan. What we're hoping to do um, with interacting with um, the, the survey services group here at ISR is to collect a uh, SES representative sample of Michigan within 500 miles, is that what we said? I feel like th these are things that are ongoing. 500 miles? <laughs> Coulter's like, throw it out there, whatever. 500 miles. Whatever we can like, generally like, um, drive to. So again, this would be a representative sample of Michigan. One of the other advantages, and I know people have talked about this, but it's a huge advantage we have in the state of Michigan, is that we have the neonatal blood bank here in Michigan. We're only uh, one of two states that have this available for research where since 1986, I can't remember exactly uh, the date, we've been, every infant that's been born in the state of Michigan has had four blood spots taken. One always belongs to the individual and the three others are available for research. And so you can actually get at birth um, any kind of genetic information that, that you want and then if you take another blood sample sometime thereafter, you can actually look at epigenetic changes. But it's this, this huge positive for anybody doing studies in Michigan to actually have this available to be able to do. California has it in many other states don't have it or if they did have it, as I heard from Coulter the other day, they've actually destroyed these blood spots and so you can't uh, use them at all. Uh, and so I would really encourage people to think about using those. Uh, so we want to to add those actually into our study, which we didn't have the advantage of in doing New York, so we actually might be able to look at epigenetic changes, changes between infancy uh, and the time of entering school uh, where we could get blood. All right, so the proposed analyses. So we want to chart these specific pathways linking variations in the home environment to uh, SES-related changes in the brain. We know that there's structure changes. We want to look at whether or not there's functional changes. Um, and so how does it work? So one of the things that we can do right now um, is look at the, the uh, structural equation models I've looked at and just add another variable, right? So we collect the information from the genes and we can look at high risk and uh, low risk alleles and we can put those in as a category. Uh, we can take the information from the brain and we can um, shove it down like we do all of our variables we ask for in survey research um, and make it into a variable that represents um, either how quick, uh, amount of errors, um, speed, connections. We can put those in and look at those in a regression uh, equation, which is what the structural equation modeling are. What happens in that situation, and it happens actually uh, even in our survey research, as soon as we begin doing this data reduction, we lose what might be very interesting variability. And we know that uh, the, the low SES families often are much more highly variable even on our achievement measures. So as soon as we go to looking at things like the mean and the median and the, and the betas, we're taking all of that information and, and ba basically looking at the average or the, or the centrality of what's going on. 
So what I'm hoping to do, because now when we have genetic information coming in and we have brain information coming in, we have very complex data coming in. So really the least complex of the data we have uh, are the survey measures that we have. And so what can we do in order to take that kind of complexity, not reduce it down to a small variable, but instead look at the reasons why certain kids are going into school or certain kids are in certain home environments and they're having the kind of outcomes they're having. Right? This is an innovation we have yet to figure out. But Rich is going to give us some idea. I keep pointing to him because I keep telling him, you have to tell us what to do. So hopefully he'll be able to tell us. But I just wanted to tell you why that's a particular issue for us, right? So we, we can right now put in a proposal that says we're going to just add these in as variables and we're going to predict. We're going to add these in as mediators and I'm going to see if they mediate. But we're losing some of the advantages by doing that. Uh, so this is what we've said already. We're going to look at mediation effects. We're going to deal with missing data. We're going to look at it in a few different ways. Um, we're going to use bootstrap methods and Bayesian methods. And so we have multi-level mediation models. So we have uh, all the good stuff that we should have in there. We have the extra part of using, this is the part I was talking about, having an IV available to us. So an instrument in order to look at actual, to look at causality, which is very unusual to have, but the school cutoff gives us the potential for looking at that. Um, we can do it using fixed effects dummies, um, like ANOVAs, we can look at random effects, um, we can, and then we can use the IV approach. Usually you do all of these, um, starting off with the, um, um, the least squares and kind of moving forward to see how you're getting the precision that you're getting by being able to introduce each of these different aspects and ending with the instrumental variable approach which is hopefully the one that's uh, the most likely to tell you whether or not there's a causal link. So we, we have that available to us because of the school cutoff that we're using. So now we're at audience participation time. So I've tried to like lay out our ideas. I didn't have the issues of the schooling. Uh, I don't have the issues of what we're doing with the fMRI. That's why I'm gonna ask Fred and Luke to talk about that if you have questions about that. And Coulter Mitchell is here to talk about the genetics. He just came on recently. He probably, this is the first time he's seen some of this. <laughs> so he may be getting put kind of on the spot to be doing it. And then I'm hoping Rich will talk a little bit about ways we can think about combining this complex data with our behavioral survey data uh, and, th and, and really taking advantage of variability instead of getting rid of variability, uh, since I think that variability is where all the action is. So I'm going to open it up first. I'm going to go to Rich. Do you have any thoughts? Uh, yeah. Yeah, don't start with me. I'm sorry, I can't start with Rich. Rich wants me to circle back. So does anyone have any questions about what we're trying to do? It is a big undertaking. Um, NIH is very excited about it, and we are convinced we will be able to do it. There's no problem in actually implementing this. Uh, it's really what we do on the other end with the data that's the issue. Have I overwhelmed everybody? Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about the sample and where it's going to be? I, I got the impression that it's something here in Southeast Michigan. Yes. It wasn't exactly clear. Huh? Yeah, so, so the reason I'm not as clear as I could be is we're, because we just moved it from New York, um, we're still trying to work out exactly what it's going to be in Michigan. But the idea is that it'll be, uh, because we want to use the neonatal blood bank, that it'll include um, Southeast Michigan, pretty much as far as we can get, I mean, this is, this is the reality of doing data collection as inexpensively as we can. So one of the things that the Fragile Family Project has really helped us understand is the way to get people into the magnet is to drive out and get them and bring them in uh, to University of Michigan. One of the, I've actually been talking to one of the vice presidents of research, Brian Falks, about the fact that it's actually a limiting feature of having people come into the University of Michigan, especially those of lower income, they don't like to come into Ann Arbor. Um, and so we've been talking about creating a pediatric neuroimaging center actually out by um, kind of Pfizer, that area that's been redone because people can get right off the highway. They could come to the imaging center and get right back on the highway. That part of doing research in a university is, is not being very appealing to certain groups of people. So uh, Fragile Families is literally going and driving them uh, here, uh, keeping them all day for hours, testing the heck out of them, uh, and then sending them back on their way. 
they, they pay them well to come and do that. Um, but we will be doing something similar to that as well, and that's why it's within a restricted area. So it will represent the state of Michigan. It won't be nationally representative. Are they going to have tasks to do in the fMRI, or is it just yes. yes. Yep. So yeah, in the fMRI, they'll be doing some of these executive function tasks. So we have ones that are the go, no, go task where you see something that you're supposed to see, and then when you see it, you hit a button, and when you don't see it, you don't hit. So we'll look for errors in, in those type of things. Um, what are some of the other ones? We have a face task where we're looking at emotional regulation, which is you see fear faces or happy faces, and we know that people respond differently uh, to those, and so we'll have that for emotional regulation. Uh, what are some of our other tasks? I can remember those right off the top of my head. Um, I think those are the main ones. Okay. Do, it might do a reward task too, where they get prizes uh, and points. Right. The, the go no go is a really cool one. It's a whack-a-mole task where they play whack-a-mole. <coughs> it's just a whack-a-mole, and then the mole comes up with different disguises on. But then when it's um, like a cucumber or something pops up instead, it's the same shape that you don't whack it. So it's like a child-friendly version of the go no go. Don't whack the cucumber. So, so why is looking at faces emotion regulation? So now you're talking about the person who doesn't know emotion regulation. I'll point to Luke. I would not okay. call it emotion regulation. I'm sorry. I thought I thought that's what the task was. Okay. Um, yeah. So they're not. I don't. I don't really like most of the emotion regulation tasks out there. But um, this is a really basic task about emotional processing, and it's really really good uh, at getting the amygdala going and getting individual differences in the amygdala. So our amygdalas to emotional faces respond really well, and uh, individual differences in that response have been mapped on to things from depression, anxiety, to any social behavior and externalizing. Um, so, but it's a, it's a tough task because it's a very simple task. They just, uh, like in Chris Monk's version of it, they just say whether it's a male or a female, so it's an implicit measure of emotion. Um, and I wouldn't call it something broader than that. Um, and if, once you get into emotion regulation, it's very hard to tell whether people are having the emotion whether they're regulating it, and the speed at which we can collect the data in the MRI, because it only is taking samples every two seconds, it's hard to know if you're already getting what was regulated or what happened from the bottom up, if that makes sense. So that's one limitation, I think, in MRI is that I don't love the emotion regulation literature with that because it's hard to measure at that speed. So you talked briefly about being interested in connectivity in addition to right. information. I'm curious if, if you're talking about connectivity in like, ta like a, a PPI type framework or if you're collecting resting state data too. Yes, both. And we'll do DTI and um, structural frame too. Okay. Yep. And then we'll go. Okay, here and there. Okay, there, there first. <laughs> go to Sammy next. How relevant the data could be, and uh, how uh, what kind of how long the data will be stored uh, to be analyzed? So, so the newborn data you're talking about the blood spots. Yeah. So we we haven't. We're not doing anything with that. The nice thing about uh, it's already collected. It's already stored um, in. I think it's in Lansing. Is that right? Or is it? I'm sorry. It's in Detroit. Um, and all we do actually, it's 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 more complicated to get this through the I. IRB that I'm about to tell you. But really, all you do is get the signature from the parent that says it's okay for us to get the blood spot. I asked because when I in January, and you just reminded me that I signed that. Uh, you did. Yeah, it's actually, it's a, it's, a great, it's a great way. You know, you're signing all kinds of stuff, so security, da, da, da. You know, like, oh, let's just sneak that in there. Can we use that for research? It's a fantastic way to, like, you know, get a lot of data without parents knowing what they're doing in that moment of lack of, like, sleep and everything. It's like, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I wonder exactly. whether there could be some kind of selective bias in the sense that, you know, if, if a child was not born in a hospital or even if a child was born in a hospital, but the parents kind of, you know, have some confidentiality concern. Mm -hmm. I right. remember I said it because I thought, well, it's about sex. So well, and, and it's used for lots of really good things, right? So they're, they're, they're getting it in order to make sure that there's no genetic issue going on, right? But, um, I, it, at that point where the parent signs and says, can we get that, that's the point where they can say, no, we don't want you to have that information, right? So that's the IRB signature. You were going to... So I was just going to tell me, I wish Dan were here, Dan Keating. Yeah. More about this, but my memory is, is it's only been in, since 2007 that parents have had the opportunity to sign for that. Up until then... They just took it. Just stored. 
Yeah. Yeah. Everyone yeah. is born in a hospital, so which is most people. Uh, you know, there's a small bias for people who don't, but um, but then I the numbers I've seen so far suggest that most parents are still deciding that. Uh, I don't know what the true selection bias is, but I think it's pretty small. Yeah. And in reality, that's probably not the biggest of all the selection biases that we're going to have. It's going to be... Yeah, they won't send for that, and I just come and let us Right, right. That's, right. That's, that's They're not saying the easiest thing they have to sign, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Sammy, did you? Yeah. Did you get a sense of why NIH wasn't comfortable with you guys looking at genetics or didn't want to fund it? Yeah, and, I, and I, I don't actually know, for those of you who might have tried recently, I don't know if they're still on that. It was because the, the um, research on candidate genes was kind of all over the place. So part of uh, the issue with the larger genome projects, and, and you may have known this, people thought as soon as we um, understood uh, the genome, we were going to solve everything, right? So, and just something I've, I've, I've found out through this whole thing, the only uh, genome that we really understand is that of European background. We really don't understand it for other races. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's actually many more limitations than I think most people know about what we understand about the genome. Um, and so. Right now, in fact, they were showing, I think we're up to six pages, very small type of candidate genes that are now being thrown out for all kinds of uh, outcomes. And so I think at, at that point, NIH was like, you know, this research, this kind of, oh, I'm going to pick this candidate gene and I'm going to predict it here, uh, was not reliable. And so they didn't want to see all of these uh, um, grants coming in. They just say, oh. I collected these four and I'm, I'm going to now, you know, regress it onto this outcome and, and that was their reaction to it. And I, I don't know, Coulter, do you know anything more? Or? Well, so, I, mean, I, I, I think you're right that generally there's this, actually, it kind of reminds me, do you remember the team here that's been okay. there for the height curve? Right, the height curve, yeah. Part of the height curve uh, with, with genes, but, um, but, and I'm just still interested in them generally, it's just the way that you frame it. And so if you say, I'm going to test this one gene, and it's pulled off of these three or four articles, that's never going to fly, as for you. But, but I've had several things go through just fine. It's just the way that you frame it, and you may be looking at you know, gathering uh, genome-wide data and looking at you know, candidate regions or something more sophisticated than I'm going to look at one SNP, call it a gene, and uh, say it represents a whole system, which is kind of what the candidate world was originally right. about. I, think I mean, I think it, when everybody like jumps on the bandwagon, right, and then you, you start not doing the research the way it needs to be rigorously done, I think that's what was happening, and so NIH was putting a stop to it. It's also the size of the sample, so I think NIH is very happy to fund statistical genetic samples of 10,000 or 50,000 or 100,000 or a million but we can't image that many people in that amount of time. So, you know, the sample size would be four or 500, which for an imaging study is really big, but um, for, a, for a genetic study, like a genome-wide study, it would be kind of a joke, I think, the sample size was. Right. And so I do want to say for fragile families, you guys are imaging like 450, right? Or, I mean, a lot, 300, which is one of the largest imaging studies being done. So it's, it's pretty incredible. When you talk about families, do you mean mothers or do you mean fathers as well? I mean mothers and fathers, because I think we have to get data on both. Your experiences are similar to what we've had over the decades. You'll get many more mothers and fathers that will come in, and you'll get many more biological mothers. The fathers will be stepfathers or some other right. relationship. <laughs> So hopefully the advantage of having a sociologist like Coulter Mitchell in, on board will help us think about um, the issues of marital status, but I agree. I mean, so I, I worked on the panel study of income dynamics, child development supplement, trying to get father data, um, and it, it's, it, it is more difficult than getting moms to talk about their kids is to get dads talking about their kids. Yeah. Uh, well, we're not in imaging them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is our car. You got to get out. Uh, um, right. I mean, it's and and I have students who are in my social development class right now. We've been complaining constantly about this bias toward toward the mother. One of the ways I talk about, and you heard me say it, I always talk about parental educational attainment, not maternal, which is really dominant and developmental because I really want to understand all the education levels that are available to the child in the home to really understand cognitive stimulation. So I look at it more broadly. 
uh, than mothers, but it, it, it is a challenge to get dads uh, either from uh, just the fact that we don't have it set up to get dads, uh, but, or because dads have to actually self-select themselves out of the study. Can you talk a little bit more about the actual model uh, analytics? Like, you have a ton of data. Are you just kind of putting this into a regression and, and seeing what you can pull from that, or, or using more sophisticated? I would like not to do that. I think what we have proposed now is exactly that. Um, because those, that's the statistics that, I mean, th those are the kind of statistics we have for doing this. So we could, um, and Rich, I'm coming back to you. It's your time. <laughs> you can sit there and try to avoid it. But, but this is, yeah, this is what we're hoping to do is to be able to actually not get rid of some of that interesting variance. I will say with structural equation modeling, we may, may be able to model some of it right, this, this difference, and we might be able to model some of that differences within different groups in SES. Uh, that'll help us a little bit more than just doing a regular regression uh, model. But I think it, it really is complicated how we would take, uh, even t getting this information out of the magnet is, is complicated enough. What you have to like pay attention to as far as the signal, what matters is, <laughs> is complex. So there, there's that kind of complexity. Um, but I'm hoping with kind of more of the, um, the big data types of analyses that are coming on that we'll have some opportunities to actually utilize that uh, to help. And again, that's why I think the problem will actually be the behavioral data, which is much less complex than the genetic, but go. <laughs> The MRI data also longitudinal in the sense that the same participant will have multiple times at which they go in the magnet? That is what we're hoping, right? That we get at least two. I mean, we know we're going to get one. Luke's looking very like, uh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually more about scanning rate than budget. It's about how many kids in a, in a five-year span we can scan twice. Right, there's only so many we can scan during the summer. If we're trying to scan in a discrete period of time in the summer, when they're all not in school versus distributing across the year, it makes the demands higher. So it's as much about budget as just like how many people you can run in the summer. Right. Run it all on the magnet. Right. And that's the big problem. Wouldn't it be a lot, lot better to have a few kids twice than a lot of kids just once? Yeah, we talked about sampling, right? So we, you know, especially if we have. Um, the sampling on a representative sample and then of that take it like a random sample of that group. Um, we could do something like that. I think we've gone back and forth about it and thinking that it would be good just to get the population uh, of, that we could get. We've talked about extending past the summer uh, into the school. Um, so those, those, are, those are things we keep talking about. Yeah, exactly that, you know, because then, then at least we, we have a random number of people that, that we could use and it works better for us. Yeah, but yes, two time points. I was gonna, I'd like to use like a plan missing this design where we scan, you know, something like 60 to 70 percent and we think the estimators will still be robust at that rate, but make sure it's actually plan missing so it's totally random who does and doesn't get scans. So our total sample size would be bigger than the people we're restricted to in terms of the logistics of scanning kids. Right. There's some statistics out now that we can do plan missingness on scan data, so which is interesting. I'm still coming so back I'm, to you. I'm <laughs> So it's good to hear that you're um, asking to go beyond uh, regressions, because typically that's what most of us, including myself, uh, we do, right? We right. collect lots of data, and then we try to shoehorn it into <coughs> techniques that we know, which typically are some form of regression. Um, but in addition to thinking about new statistics to do on these data, it might also be helpful to think about the data themselves in new ways. So um, typically what we do is we, have, we, we represent data in the way that they were originally designed for. So if you're looking at cortisol data, right, there's standard ways of analyzing, sorry, representing cortisol data. There's standard ways of representing imaging data. There's standard ways of representing the behavioral data. And maybe we need to take a step back and even take a more foundational approach to even thinking about our data from the beginning. Um, so when you have a developmental approach where you're trying to look at changes, in addition to the, to the very nice feature of the regression discontinuity that you've got this sort of random event almost, right, which is the birthday, and that they're able to start first grade before or after December 1. So you've got this that very elegant kind of property of the design. Uh, now the 
the psychological questions are, well, maybe it isn't the average level of cortisol that matters. Maybe it's when the peak occurs or the delay in which something occurs, right? Or if you're doing epigenetic data, maybe the mean of the methylation is not the appropriate number. Uh, I'm starting to work with them, some methylation data with Coulter. And uh, it's very uh, eye-opening for me. The, for those of you that haven't worked uh, with methylation data, which was me a week ago, <laughs> uh, uh, each subject provides over 400,000 numbers. And typically what people will do is average those 400,000 numbers and give, you know, you assign a score for each subject and then you start running correlations. Um, but when you look at the distributions, within a subject of those 400,000 scores, it's bimodal. Most of them are very close to zero. In other words, a very low percentage of methylation. Or they're very high, they're very close to 100% methylation. And the differences across people seem to be in the height of those two, you know, the, the zero could be high or low, or the peak of one could be high or low. Um, also, there's variability, uh, the, uh, the distribution of the, the per percentages of methylation over the 400,000 sites or islands that are measured. So the, the individual variation is large in terms of what percent is of their uh, linked sites are no, higher than low. Uh, each island is assigned a percentage, and for a single person, there's 400,000 percentages. So if you do a histogram, of that, you find two peaks, a peak near zero and a peak near 100%. And that varies in terms of the height of the two peaks, the width of the peaks, what happens in the middle of the trough. There's a lot of individual variability there that we're not paying attention to, right? So maybe what's important for your questions aren't, you know, isn't the average, but it might be these sort of complicated things that your environment produces on the way the, uh, the CPG sites get methylated, right, for right. example. Uh, uh, I mentioned cortisol, right? The right. You will also have behavioral trends right. on the data, on the survey data, and the behavioral tasks. So maybe what would be interesting there is not the average score, but it might be the particular growth pattern that's happening, right? And, and so it's basically rethinking what the data are actually re representing psychologically, and then trying to find the correct analysis to pinpoint in some rigorous way what you're observing in the data. Right. In fact, I think we. Those will have to be the first things, right? It's just literally observing the data first before we place on the issue of whether it's going to be regression or not. Um, because it's, this will be one of the first times when we actually combine the size of the data, the fact that we want to look at it developmentally, which adds a whole other aspect because now we're going to look at growth or lack of growth across time. We need to know whether these things grow. Uh, we know more about the behavioral data than we know about uh, the genetic data and the, uh, definitely almost nothing on the, the brain data re regarding what brains should look like as they're developing across time. We know structure, but not function, how that should change. So we have a lot of variables that we'll have to kind of figure out across time. Um, I do want to say before everybody leaves that uh, one of the interesting things about this is this is all being done right here at ISR, right? So this is taking social science into a whole new realm, and we're all learning this almost <laughs> like Rich, last week. <laughs> I just learned about this. And so, and, um, but these are the kind of questions for me that I'm interested in. Why, why do we see these differences uh, with socioeconomic status? Why is where a child lives or what they're exposed to predicting uh, to some of the outcomes they're, they're looking at? What are the mechanisms of this? So those are the kind of things that, that we're interested in, but we have a lot of things to figure out. And I think most of them are this data. We, so we'll have massive amounts of data, uh, and how do we use them differently than we've used them before? And we know not all kids in poverty do poorly. Why? And um, why are the ones who are do poorly, what are they being exposed to that's, that's doing this? And is it something about how the brain is at the moment? Is it something about how it changes? And, and we haven't talked about the school thing, but what Fred, Fred's already um, using ERP in the schools and already looking at variations in curriculum uh, and how kids are, are learning. So it's, we, we've also broken into that area of how does one do scanning in, in the schools 
Um, and so that, that's going to be another part of this. We haven't even laid upon all the multi-level information that will be coming in. Right, so another nice thing about thinking about these questions now when you're writing the proposal is that um, I think this is the best way in which uh, statistical consulting can improve research is at the, you know, at the ground. Which is why he's the head of the data core for this PO1. <laughs> what happens is people will come to people like me when the data are already collected and then say, here, help me salvage this. You know, we've got all kinds of problems. And then so the, the creativity is really stifled because of what we can do, right? The best we can come up with, well, here's a better way of dealing with missing data. Uh, you know, that's about the, the depth of, of what we can provide. But, at, you know, coming in at the very beginning, we can actually influence the design, the measures, uh, make suggestions about the time points. Um, you know, how, even if you do have the same scanner, how are you going to deal with the, the drift that will happen over the two or three year period, you know, even with the same scanner? Um, the connectivity issues, I think we have some pretty good methods for assessing connectivity in brain imaging data for data collected at one point in time. I don't, don't know we're, we're so adept yet at understanding how connectivity might change over time. Right. So that's an opportunity to develop whole new measures. And it, maybe all, it's all exploratory. We, I mean, we don't have anything to, to bounce right. off of. And then the, 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 someone earlier mentioned the analytic approach. There's a lot of hype around big data right now. And uh, some of it is hype, but some of it is just very counterintuitive ways to think about data. So most statisticians, since the beginning of time, have thought about the problem in terms of reducing the dimensionality. You have lots of data, so let's simplify it. Let's reduce the dimensions, right? Either do a PCA to get the factor, do regression to limit the number of predictors, or reduce. But one of the intuitions that come out of the big data is that actually you can expand the dimensionality. You can make a problem even more complicated. And sometimes when you do that, the solution becomes trivial and simple. Um, I can show some, you know, I don't have my laptop with me, but there's basically some really nice kind of uh, examples that you can show with classification. That the classification problem in the way the data are represented or in a reduced dimension is actually very difficult. But if you just expand it, add a dimension, make it more complicated, it, it becomes trivial. And so that's one of the big insights that come from um, da the data analytic approach, which is just the opposite of what the first gut level uh, reaction of what people trained in statistics would do, which is to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. And for those of you who don't know why we reduce it, it's so that we can analyze it in, with the statistics that we have available, right? right. So that's why we always reduced. <laughs> Many of these outcomes are, uh, these cognitive outcomes are temporarily sensitive. Is there any way around kind of the confound of you know, the goal and how long it takes to measure this brain activity? Like perhaps maybe using uh, another imaging technique in addition to FMRI, like EEG perhaps? Yeah, we thought about that. I mean, we, we thought about could we, especially for the little kids, could we add EEG? I think. Um, I think we decided we just didn't want to add the extra complication and um, to having it because so here's just another <laughs> so then that means that we have to take EEG information and figure out how that maps on the fMRI right so we act I even thought about um, well let's use because Rich told me that we can now use uh, EEGs in the fMRI scanner, so then we could calibrate. But we don't—I don't know if anyone has that calibration information. There's only so much in this PO1 that I want to like do new. <laughs> I, like, we, we need to be able to stand on something, you know, at the end of the day. Um, and so that I think in the end we decided just to go ahead and push the um, magnet as far as or the kids try to get them in as much as we could. Maybe use some of the planned missingness techniques or random selection. Uh, type of idea uh, so as not to have two modalities going on simultaneously. I do think in the future, once we get those calibrations done, we will be able to go across development and be, I don't know, I still sitting there as the EEG expert. Do you think that's going to be possible that we'll be able to go across EEG and fMRI at some point? Um, I just dropped the fMRI. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or we could just drop F, but then we can't get amygdala, right? We can't do that in EEG. So, yeah. Who cares, right? <laughs> are you using amygdala to be emotion? 
It, well, and for uh, uh, regulation and for uh, behavioral problems, so we're looking at it uh, for that as well, and for anxiety and mental health issues. But it does everything. Yeah, I mean. Repetitive motivation and aversive motivation. So right. The, the need for it is not so essential if you don't know what it's doing. Well, do we know what it's doing? That's a good question. We, I, I don't, Luke, you're the amygdala man. Yeah, I mean, it does a lot of things. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think there's good evidence that, it, that it's both linked to psychopathology and changes across development in terms of its function. But it, yeah, it does a lot of things. I think it's more about kind of like arousal and orienting than it is about anything specific, which it will do to a lot of things. Right. Arnold. I guess the, the core contribution is you're saying I'm collecting data in a variety of domains that you think influence these developmental outcomes. We're going to put them into one analysis. Uh, and uh, following up on what Rich said, I mean, here's a measure that anybody can use. They're going to do methylization, methylation analyses, and maybe we'll find a new way of analyzing that data. Uh, I wonder to the extent that some of the measures are unique to this project as opposed to anybody else using them. Uh, and especially getting around the behavioral outcomes. Uh, I haven't followed up on this literature, but what's happening with the NIH toolbox, for example, which is a commonly uh, uh, agreed upon set of measures for measuring cognitive development. So what's interesting about that is that they're agreed upon but not by anybody I work with, who says that, oh yeah, there's the NIH toolbox, but no, those aren't the best measures of executive function. So I don't know who made the agreement, but then as soon as we work, like for example, Kim Noble was the first person who said, oh, let's use them. Oh yeah, but BJ Casey doesn't like to use them because they're not really executive function. So part of that is, is our inability to decide what is an actual measure of anything. Um, and whether or not the NIH toolbox is agreed upon and agreed upon by, by whom and then who uses it, right? So uh, at the moment we're using the ones that are in the literature that have been utilized by the people who study executive function, whether they're in the NIH toolbox or not in the NIH toolbox. And for those of you who don't know, the NIH try to do something, which an IES, who the educational research people do this too, which is try to say, where is the agreement in the field of the measures that are best for looking at these type of things? The problem is there isn't agreement in the field. Uh, and then once they actually establish them, they've done this for education sciences too, there's just as about as much disagreement on what they figured out as the ones that they figured out. So par part of that I think is either all of us agreeing that that's true or, because I, I, I actually hate that we keep putting new measures in because we just keep measuring the same thing or what we blatantly say the same thing over and over again. And, and I would like there to be some consensus because I think it, it, it's the reason why we see so much differences in the um, data we're seeing. Yep. Well, yep, sorry. Uh, given that there's, okay, there's some slippage of whether these are the right measures, in terms of grant writing strategy with NIH and SHP, be happier if we're saying we're using some of the toolbox things versus saying. I don't know. I mean, I've never had, I mean, Fred, do you have any thoughts about that, whether or not using the toolbox? I mean, I've never had any, any reviewers or anyone even say, why aren't you using the NIH toolbox? Well, it's the same reason, I think, on the, the sense is that um, there's, there isn't uniform agreement about, um, you know, the, the overall validity of the assessments that, that they're using. Um, I, I can't remember what the age span of the toolbox is, but I think that's also an issue that um, like a lot of these things, they're floor and, and, and ceiling effects, so it, it's not uniformly applicable depending upon the age that you're using. I think it's more applicable for older kids than younger kids. And everything's more reliable for older than younger, I can tell you that. It's, it's, what, you know, it's what I've called sort of this measurement mayhem. Yes. Um, in the field, um, we we and there's conceptual clutter that goes along with it, um, <laughs> and so it would be very useful to try to come up with a uniform, a more, a more uniform set that we could all use. I don't think necessarily any one is is better than the other, and I don't think that's the issue. They're all correlating with each other fairly modestly. <laughs> so if we could just agree, okay, we're going to use this set for the next ten years, 
that would probably be the best thing we could do. So everybody just uses their pet, pet measure. Or creates new ones, which drives me nuts, yeah. I wanted to ask you if the um, allowing more dimensions is related at all to more interest in individual differences, or is that... It, it could be, but it doesn't have to be about individual differences. No, it could just be um, basically adding more dimensionality instead of yeah, reducing it. Right. So, and what are some of the um, theoretical connections across these different levels of analysis? That, I mean, they, intuitively, they all feel right, right? School is important, home is important, your parents, <laughs> how they talk to you, how their, you know, their education levels and income are all important to the development of the child in all levels, right? Biological, cognitive, emotional, and that that will eventually play out in school performance. Right. So I mean, intuitively it feels right, but how hard is it gonna be to now connect the dots from a theoretical perspective in terms of, you know, from all the different directions you have to go in, in terms of telling the, the story. Um, this isn't about data, this is about the right. theory. Well, I think you know the the theory's been building for a long time uh, about the socioeconomic differences. And in fact, um, I just saw a presentation at, at the Society for Research on Child Development, which I think made this very kind of salient that these income, education, occupation to a much lower extent, marital status, number of kids in the home, have this very strong and and dramatic uh, effect on almost all the outcomes we look at that were that's important to child development at the 0 0.25, 0 0.25, very high effect sizes. What has less of an influence are the psychological variables. And in psychology, we use, in fact, Arnold, I'll send this to you because it was using your, Keith Weidman was using uh, the cumulative risk model and showing you have to weight it differently um, because of how high the, rate, the, the weights are for SES influence. Um, the psychological influence is much less. It's, it's pretty, it's 0 .10, 0 0.05. I mean, any of the psychological variables, and we usually only look at one, but even combined, rarely actually have the impact of SES. So I think, um, for me, it's always been knowing that these are lower effects, how, how is education and income flowing through these different areas to get to the child? It has to be mediated. It could be in that mediation, all those pieces, you know, all the predictabilities kind of falling apart, but I don't think I can tell the story unless I can say why is SES doing that. So that's kind of the theoretical reasoning for why uh, we're looking at it. Going to the, the brain and the biology is because there are these pieces of research that suggest those are the avenues that might be happening, right, for it. So how, if, if a parent is talking to the child, why is that having an impact? Is, what, is it increasing just some amount of vocabulary or is it changing the way their brain is functioning? Yeah. The way, one of the ways I've begun to think about it, obviously from the schooling perspective, let's say, you know, one thing that would, would be fun to look at is, you know, you know we're hoping to get school effects uh, as we've been done in the past on academic achievement. We're hoping to get some school effects on executive function. But one simple step would be to ask, may, maybe we're going to get schooling effects on the brain before we get it yeah. in behavior, okay? Yeah. Um, and that would indicate in some sense that, well, some things are changing, but they're not manifest in behavior. That's school. But what about, so what happens, though, to that relation in a home environment that is more or less stimulating, okay? Oh, so now it seems, and I don't have the answer to that, but, but it seems it's, it's at that level of complexity and longitudinally where now you have to think, oh, I have to start thinking a little bit differently about this. That's, that's where I think some of this creativity or whatever you call going to come in, um, where you're going to have to take all of this data into account and really think about it differently. So it isn't any one you know, univariate relation, but it's, it's the longitudinal data where you're looking at many different outcomes and their mediation or moderation or you know, tendencies. That's, again, I don't have it in my head. That may be, that's the kind of thing, you know, you can probably work through better than us, but it's at that level, I think, where we could, we're gonna have new models, new ways of thinking. Right, and I, I was talking to Bill about this before we came in. One of the problems with working with younger kids is that um, 
all of the measures we're using, this is I guess true for everyone, but all the measures we're using are, are confounded by the kids being able to understand what we're, we're doing and, and, and I've been talking with Fred about this. We're testing executive function at the same time. We're using executive function to get kids to answer information. So having another window where we can look and see what might be going on. We, we know that um, the brain may be foreshadowing quite a few things that are happening that we don't see in behavior until later, right? Because behavior is really based on our ability to create a measure to see that behavior. Uh, but I was talking about dyslexia, for instance. We already see dyslexia happening in the brain before we can ever test for dyslexia. So it could be that we find, we, we see things starting to show up um, in, in function or structure that are, that are going to give us some opportunities ahead of time to say, well, we know later on this is now correlated with a problem that we have to deal with. And so that might be the avenue that the brain is at. Yulia Kolvaman has found this now with bilingual education as well, where you start seeing some issues with, with uh, uh, having multiple languages in the home uh, prior to being able to pick up any differences on any language scale. The brain is already looking different. Um, so maybe that's where we'll start being able to have something like interventions or how the brain will give us more information. When it gets more complex, we may not be able to see some of these differences, but we'll see them as the brain's developing. Any other questions? So I'm just curious if you can, you can so, so, so one way to sort of operationalize, operationalize this, right? So, so the challenge with, with the domain you're entering is sort of this, this so-called curse of dimensionality, right? And so, so a lot of your data, you're, you're accustomed to having many, many observations and, and narrow dimension, right? And as you move into either genomics or like connectomic imaging or neuroimaging, you, know, you still have a lot of data points, but you have this massive dimensionality. Right. And so you can cast it as sort of like a manifold learning problem where you assume that there, there's some latent space, whether it's a reduction or whether it's a projection in, in a higher like polynomial or other kernelized space. Um, but, but you have to, at some point, to sort of evaluate whether whether you're you're really fitting something interesting, cast it as like a classification problem or a prediction problem. And so I'm just curious what some of the, the sort of sub problems you see falling out of this might be, right? So I so I can imagine trying to like classify which are the kids that were schooled and which are not, right? And if you can classify that, you can then interrogate the decision function right. that's being used. Can you can you predict later behavioral outcomes on the basis of early brain scanning, right? So so. This is all really, really ambitious and really exciting. Right. But a, a more useful initial target, I'm, I'm just curious what sort of sub-problems you see targeting in the early stages. And I, I think I mean, you're right. We, we had that in the first version of the P01, um, where there was this section of a paragraph in you know, cross-validation. Right. And so the idea is that we would be building some models, some pre predictive models on a subset of data and then test out those predictions on a holdout sample, right? Mm -hmm. And do that repeatedly so that we could assess using cross-validation the predictive validity of the models that we develop. Um, so the, the first iteration of this, we were encouraged by the program officer not to do too many new things, to just do standard stuff. Um, so the, what, what, what yeah, what so had listed before was from a was, submission. Was very was standard, but yeah. Now, now we kind of have the green light to be a little bit more creative on the analysis with this version. Um, right, so yeah. these are things that we could de definitely do, right? We can just take everything mean it or create a subscale of fMRI, again, risk alleles, uh, and, and we can do all of these methods, right? Stick them into our usual thing. What we're hoping to do is um, some more new stuff, right? Because I, I, again, I think even the, the work that's coming out about sensitivity, these risk alleles and, and these non-risk alleles are suggesting to us that there's some sensitivity and that's gotta be in the heterogeneity, right? That we're looking at. And so if we get rid of all that heterogeneity, then we're losing some of the story for these kids. But that, I would say that that's true for all the work we're doing, right? That we have to think differently about the statistics that we're doing. And, and I just want to say, I don't think it's because we don't have the statistics. A lot of the reasons why we did and have continued to do what we did, do is because we didn't have the computational power. We no longer have that problem, but we're still doing old statistics based on low statistical ability to c compute. And so, we are. We have to kind of all step up our game a little bit. You have a psychologist or a better a develop, developmental psychologist on your team. I am a developmental psychologist. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm surprised. 
so is Fred. <laughs> The stuff you call physical environment, I mean, when you said the psychological effects aren't so big, I mean, you're listing stuff to me that are big psychological issues, like the safety, if there's someone to go to, or even, I would guess, and I don't know, I mean, this is almost a different study, but the, the monotony of the environment is, well, how long have you been in that environment to be able to fix it up and decorate it? And have you had the time to do it? Or language that has to do with whether you have time to look at the kid and to, you know. Right, no, I, I think, you know, yes, yeah. You know, as, as was shown with monkeys, you know, so even. Kind yeah, of I think that the reason I said that about the physical environment is because it hasn't, um, that hasn't been one in previous studies that's popped up as being one of the major predictors, this physical environment. I think there's all kinds of things we can come up with, but it hasn't, um, as far as, especially to things like executive function and achievement, um, trying, that just hasn't been a predictor before, right? It's kind of fallen under cognitive stimulation. Do you play games with your kid? Do you read to your kid? That's always been uh, a powerful predictor, but now the actual environment, except for what you're, I mean, none of this is about the interaction of the parent with the environment, though that can be, um, that, that can be part of it. Obviously, if you didn't decorate your house, that's part of the reason why. There is some research on... The environment beyond the usual things. Yeah. So the, um, I mean, there is research on a clean house. So there's been a lot of work out of the PSID that's shown having a clean house, which I think is re just related. I mean, there's a whole issues of endogeneity of other things, beliefs and motivations of the parent themselves about the environment mm -hmm. that we don't have included in there. So that was... Um, and I will say, as a developmental psychologist, the monotony makes sense, but some of these other things were less intuitive to achievement, which is what I'm looking at, and executive function. Is this going to involve observation in the goal? Or the, those are all observational measures. So yep. you're going to sit there and do ratings? Yeah. So, well, interviewers go in, and while they're doing other things, they're also monitoring mm -hmm. what goes on. And some of them are questions, like how safe do you feel is actually a question to the parent, but the monotony is actually derived from the interviewer being in the home. We don't ask the people, why is your house monotonous? You know, so it's, <laughs> we're good about that. <laughs> yep. Probably a bit of a self-conceived question, but I was wondering if it may um, I was wondering if anyone's tried sort of, when you guys were talking about dimensions, sort of plotting things in three-dimensional space. And sort of um, instead of length, width, and height, you get an EEG measure, an fMRI measure, and a self report measure. And then, so picture a cube. And then generate a cube at time one, a cube at time two, and a cube at time three, and maybe observations or PDFs. Yeah, so you? Yeah, I've done that. Yeah, I was going to say. Some of the booths data, where it's got imaging, behavioral, and um, I forgot what the third one was, sure. but we had these yeah. cubes and we can rotate them. Yeah, so this yeah. is a, sort yeah. of a cool idea where, and then maybe the observations or people are clustered yeah. yes. within that particular cube. And, right. You know, it, it's sort of stopping the dimension reduction at the very first stop by just sort of bottom of the space. Um, but, so that was a question if anyone's done I guess we're chess. So. All right, we're at the end. Right. Feel free to come up and ask us any questions. <laughs>